The first presentation for today is um, from Christopher Kunz, and he's talking about software-defined networking in an open source compute cloud. Have fun. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's all right and didn't get to bed too, uh, too late last night. Um, I actually um, tried to um, shovel in a couple other slides about um, what transpired on Tuesday, and I'll just talk about this real quick because it's a, the, the actual bug, bug is a real good example about um, how um, stacked idiocy can lead to catastrophic problems. Um, on Tuesday, we all learned about a new um, bug in OpenSSL, which has impact on well, about one-fourth of all SSL-secured web servers. And um, I thought it would be good to have some um, up-to-date information and a little more in-depth detail than what you see on uh, the typical Slashdot-style articles. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Christopher. I um, studied computer science in Hanover, Germany, and did my PhD there in 2011, actually, not 12. Um, and uh, ironically, um, I had an SSL-related topic, and I actually worked with the OpenSSL API um, for a while, so I know the pain that people are probably going through right now. Um, I've been working for a hosting company called Filou for um, 15 years now. Um, I have some admin experience, therefore. Um, I couldn't help it. And uh, I used to do a lot of PHP back then, and I'm not really shy to, to admit that, because um, it has his uh, merits. Um, I wrote a book about PHP security, which is a very grateful topic because there's a lot of stuff to write about. Um, and in my free time, I um, mesh steel into people. That's a bit odd maybe for some, but it's really fun. Just a very quick ad about my company. We are um, a hosting company. We offer everything from colocation racks in Frankfurt, Germany, to um, IIAS solutions. Um, we have written something that's between a toolkit and a middleware for our own uh, cloud product, which is completely based on open source software. Um, we use um, QEMO, uh, KVM for uh, virtualization, and um, Open vSwitch for the network layer, and we have a Ceph um, cluster as a backend storage. Um, we are a 100% subsidiary of Thomas Krenage, the hardware vendor who is um, also sponsoring the conference, and um, I encourage you to visit their booth and look at the machines that they have. These are the machines that run our cloud. So, um, Heartbleed in a nutshell. Um, it has a very cute name. I think it's one of the few um, security problems that has an actual logo, which is very um, impressive. And um, it's not a very cute bug. It's a, it's a pre-auth, um, pre-logging universal um, OpenSSL bug for um, OpenSSL 101A through MF. And it was introduced very um, early, actually, in um, 2012. So it's been present for um, OpenSSL since sometime in 2012. It was committed to the um, source code repository in, um, at the, in, I think, New Year's Eve 2011. Um, it allows remote attackers without authentication or any other um, preconditions to make a 64 kilobyte memory dump of the service memory. Wait a second. Um, yeah, that's a remote memory dump, and um, you can basically read from, from the service memory um, in chunks of 64 kilobytes, and of course you can repeat the exploit as, as often as you want, so you can, you can read a lot of memory if you need to. Um, this, this memory dump may contain, and I've seen most of these already, um, stuff like URLs, um, HTTP headers, um, random stuff. I've seen PHP source code and Perl source code from scripts that were running uh, on the web server um, fly by me. And um, it's also possible that SSL certificate private keys are contained in that memory dump. So um, before I go a little more in detail about the, the actual hole and what happened and what we're going to do to fix it, um, what's actually being um, done there that was vulnerable? Um, sometime in 2011, a PhD student at the University, or the, uh, a university of Applied Sciences in Münster, Germany, um, was working on his PhD project, and he was working on ways to make datagram-based protocols more reliable and encrypting um, data-based datagram-based protocols. Basically, what he was trying to do was to introduce some kind of session mechanism on UDP-based encrypted, um, encrypted connections, if you will. Um, for that, he introduced a heartbeat extension to um, 
uh, TLS over um, UDP or datagram protocols, which is DTLS. And he did it the proper way. So he had an ITF draft, he did an RFC, and he also um, did some code and committed that to OpenSSL. And um, it was committed and pr pretty uh, quickly um, acknowledged by Stephen Hansen sometime around 15th uh, till 31st of December 2011. And um, basically that's when the, when the problem uh, came to pass. The problem that we um, are seeing is not really a crypto box. So it's unrelated to Beast or other um, holes that we've seen in, uh, in the last years, um, which are now mostly attributed to the NSA planting backdoor somewhere. Um, it's, uh, it, the, the cryptographic functions of OpenSSL are not affected, at least not their primary function. If you leak a private key, your crypto is still broken, but um, this is not the, the primary um, uh, problem in the bug. It's also not a completely arbitrary memory disclosure, so you can't I don't know, uh, dump kernel memory or something. You can only dump what belongs to the process that is um, being exploited. Web server, um, IMAP server, something like that. And it's not a um, remote hold root hole. You will be very hard pressed to find, I don't know, root passwords or SSH keys or something in that memory dump. So you will probably not be able to uh, root a server with that, we hope. Um, that's why it has a relatively low ZVE score of um, five, because the higher scores are mostly um, reserved for um, code execution bugs. So what happened here? What happened was that the guy who did his PhD thesis um, designed a protocol. And he designed a heartbeat protocol that he wanted to be very flexible. So what he did basically was um, he had a heartbeat packet and a response packet, and the response packet was uh, um, supposed to be identical to the heartbeat packet. So if I say hello to you, you say hello back, and if I say foobar, you say foobar back. Um, what he also thought to be a good idea was that um, the client actually to would have to tell the server um, how long the packet is, the heartbeat packet, instead of the server just looking at the packet and um, the payload and um, just taking its length. So we have a... Um, um, 16-bit uh, payload length parameter, and we have a payload. And both are user-supplied, and um, the payload can be arbitrary content. That's actually a quote from the RFC. So um, we have arbitrary content sent from the client to the, to the server, and um, this, the client can also tell the server how long it is. Nothing can go wrong, right? Um, of course, something can go wrong, and you can see that here. Uh, we have a memory allocation here, and then we have a memory copy. And the uh, BP is a, the buffer that was defined, um, uh, initialized two lines earlier, and PL is the payload length, and um, payload is the actual payload. So the latter two variables are completely um, user-defined or client-defined, and what happens is that we allocate payload plus 19 for padding and overhead um, bytes of memory, and uh, we copy PL bytes of the payload um, via memcopy to construct the response. Actually, what they, he was trying to do was basically copy the um, payload one by one to, um, to the response packet to have identical payload and response um, payload, um, request and response payloads. So what happens is that the client sets the payload length to um, 64K and only sends one byte of um, actual payload in the um, heartbeat packet. And that, what happens now is that the mem copy still copies 64 kilobytes of memory, but only one of these, one byte of these is actual um, heartbeat payload, and the rest is memory from the um, surrounding process. So this is what went wrong, and this is what happens if you test the vulnerability. There's a couple of uh, web scripts to run, there's um, lots of Python pay, um, proof of concept scripts, and there's probably also a Metasploit package or a Metasploit module right now. Um, one of the more popular scripts is um, uh, one that you can download from um, GitHub, and it can test any um, TLS-enabled um, TCP service, no UDP yet. Um, it, does, it also has support for start TLS, so if you have um, start TLS FTP or um, SMTP services, you can, start, um, you can test that too. Um, it conveniently dumps the full 64K of memory for you if you test and um, the, the server you're testing is actually vulnerable. And this looks like, this is one of these moments where 
Alt tabbing doesn't work. Yeah. Um, this looks like this. I basically um, obscured the host a bit to protect the innocent, but I actually found a couple ones that are still vulnerable. And um, what happens here is that the script um, starts in a TLS session and sends a heartbeat request with the um, values that I just uh, talked about. And what comes back is basically memory dump. This is a full HTTP header. It's probably a Type of 3 installation. So this is the user cookie for uh, the Type of 3 front end user. And um, there are Google things here. And um, there's a PHP session ID here. So basically, if whatever happened in this request that I'm, that's being dumped here um, was done by an authenticated user, I could just go, go ahead and steal, steal their session. So that's not really good, because in my tests um, that I did yesterday and the day before, I also saw, I don't know, whatever you transmit over the web, I saw contact forms, um, private um, uh, information for, for customers, stuff like that just flies by in clear text, because obviously memory contents cannot be encrypted. So um, it's, it's pretty catastrophic. Uh, this is one of the... This is one of the screenshots that circulated on Twitter, where people actually exploited Yahoo, and that's um, Yahoo Mail. You can see in the lower three lines that someone was logging in with a, with a username Agnes Sadu Boateng, and the password is obscured. So um, Yahoo had a real issue with passwords, and we have um, announcement by a couple of um, cloud, uh, SAS, and whatever services to um, immediately change passwords, and I don't think that's uncalled for. So if you dump memory here, um, the, what, what you see is not deterministic. So um, right now, um, I think the, the opinion is that you cannot um, calculate what kind of memory you get in return. So you cannot force the server to dump its certificates or private keys and stuff like that. Um, most of the stuff is boring. It's just garbage. Or sometimes um, I, I saw GPL licenses fly by, so basically from some kind of script headers, I guess. Um, you can just f uh, put up an endless loop and um, dump stuff there and f um, put it into an out file. Um, people are not going to see what you're doing because it's, it's pre-logging, so you don't see anything on the web server logs. The only thing to detect right now is um, have a, an IDS that has signatures already. I guess there's probably going to be snort signatures soon, if not already. I know that Juniper already um, updated IDS signatures, so um, you can detect this, of course, if you look into the TCP packets. Affected services are, above all, SSL-enabled web servers that run OpenSSL 101A through F, um, but also uh, mail servers, IMAP, over SSL, um, POP3, if anybody still uses that, SMTP, um, SMTP via start TLS is also vulnerable as long as the vulnerable OpenSSL libraries are used. Um, OpenVPN is maybe vulnerable, people weren't sure yet. They um, released new versions um, also for the commercial OpenVPN product yesterday. Um, maybe other VPN products, probably Cisco is vulnerable. Um, IRC has a problem, IRC over SSL, um, XMPP, um, FTP over TLS is also uh, potentially vulnerable. There's also a vulnerability in Android 4.1.1 because that's the only Android version that ships OpenSSL with the right version and also with heartbeat, with a heartbeat function enabled. OpenSSH is not vulnerable. It uses um, OpenSSL code, but only for crypto not for um, session establishment and session management. So OpenSSH doesn't have a problem, which is good because I don't know, want to know what you would, prob would see in an OpenSSH memory dump. Um, for Linux, um, only relatively new versions are affected, or for Debian at least. Um, I run a lot of squeeze, so I didn't have that huge a problem. Many of my customers are still on squeeze, so um, that's still OpenSSL 098F, I think. But Debian Wheezy, Jesse, and Sid are affected, and there are fixes for Wheezy and Sid, or were at the time of writing. That was um, Tuesday evening. Um, Ubuntu is affected. Um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 had a patch. I don't know if they have updated packages by now. And everything else that ships OpenSSL, and that's pretty much probably everyone, because I don't know um, if a lot of people use new TLS or other SSL or TLS libraries, but I don't think there's very many. Um, clients are also vulnerable, and I think we're going to see a lot of um, client-side 
stuff in the next weeks because that's something that's um, often overlooked. If I run a server that's um, crafted to um, send these um, crafted um, uh, heartbeat packages, um, I can exploit clients, so I can get memory dumps from clients. We don't really know what um, a memory dump from a Firefox would contain. I'm not sure if it's at all interesting, but if it is, um, we can see funny things probably. Other affected stuff, um, Cisco stuff. They say they don't generally use OpenSSL, but um, their SSL VPN products are probably affected. Juniper has um, released fixes for their SSL VPN product. Um, they don't have any yet for the um, SSL-based management interfaces for their routers or switches or infrastructure stuff. Um, we don't really know about stuff like Big IP or um, camp load balancers. We don't know if um, AVMs, Fritz boxes are affected and we have another hole in the web administration front end again. Um, maybe your, your home NAS is affected, QNAP or Synology, they all ship um, basically Linux-based, Apache-based um, SSL secured web servers with their, with their products. There's a um, vendor list on the CERT uh, homepage where you can um, check out if your product is affected. There were st still a lot of unknowns um, at the time. I looked at it last time yesterday, but um, I expect it to fill up pretty soon. So what are we going to do against this? Um, yeah, it's really easy. Security Hulk says it's easy. Just revoke private keys and um, retract any data ever sent, and everything is fine and dandy. Um, first of all, you have to upgrade to a fixed OpenSSL version, and don't just upgrade OpenSSL. You ha also have to upgrade the libssl package on DEP-based uh, systems. Um, then restart all services that um, link against the old library. That's really um, a big point. Some people have resorted to rebooting to fix this. Um, basically, uh, it can happen that you have restarted Apache and you're still using the old library because the deleted version is still in the linker cache or something. I'm not very deep in uh, Linux dynamic linking, but I've seen it happen. I've seen um, machines that had a clean new uh, OpenSSL library, but were still running the old one on maybe Dovecut or any other SSL using servers, and Apache was then still affected. So basically what you can do is you can use check restart, which is provided with a Debian goodies package, or you just use Elsoft to, to see which, um, uh, which processes still have an, a version of the deleted, that's the, the grab there, the deleted uh, libssl um, in use. If you use static binaries for your stuff, you will have to recompile everything, and while you're at it, you can just add the D no heartbeat flag, so you can disable the heartbeat stuff completely. I don't really know if it's practically relevant for TLS over TCP. Um, it doesn't really make any sense to, to have an additional heartbeat protocol. It's just, it's just redundant. Um, if you use Google's Mod Speedy on Apache 2, there is a beta package there, which hasn't been updated for a while, I think a pretty long while. Um, you should just remove it because um, that's something that cost me the better part of Tuesday morning. Um, Mod Speedy brings their own Mod SSL for Apache, and that Mod SSL is statically linked, uh, or there's a statically built copy of OpenSSL in there, and that's a vulnerable static copy of OpenSSL. And what Mod Speedy does is basically it um, changes the load statement in your Apache config to um, load that new Mod SSL. And if you do um, A2 dismod to dis disable the module, as I did, um, you don't actually change that load line. So it's, the module is disabled, but it's still loading the wrong um, mod SSL. And that was really hard to debug because I just didn't have um, that mod speedy stuff on my screen anymore. So you should probably re remove that. I talked to a Google guy yesterday, and he said he might look at uh, what happened there and might look at if an updated version could be pushed out. So the really important question is, what about our certificates? Um, I think I have about 180 um, SSL certificates deployed from our customers, and it's possible that their private keys have leaked. We know of a proof of concept scenario, which is very limited right now, but might expand in the future, um, where you can have a um, freshly restarted Apache on FreeBSD, and if you um, do the um, heartbleed check on the first request, you will dump, you will see the, the private um, key for the SSL certificate that answers the request. So it's, it's not impossible. It's probably very hard at the moment, and it's not deterministically possible to dump the 
um, private keys, but it's, it's possible. So if you go by the book, you will have to revoke and reissue your certificates, that your most important or most widely deployed certificates, um, if none else. So basically, if you have wildcard certificates on 20, 30 machines, you will probably have to revoke them. And you will have not only to reissue them, but you will have to revoke them, because if someone got your private keys, and they also have your certificate, obviously, because that's public information, um, they will be able to man in the middle. They basically have a valid certificate with your uh, domain on it, and they can sign or what do whatever with it as long as it's valid, which is going to be probably a couple more months. So not only do you need to reissue, you actually need to revoke your certificate. Some CAs offer free service, but that's usually only reissue, and I don't think that really fixes the, the problem. Um, you will have to try to um, get your certificate revoked free of charge and good luck with that. If you don't have pro uh, perfect forward security in your or perfect forward uh, secrecy in your uh, web server's uh, crypto algorithms, you might have an additional problem because whoever sat on your line and sniffed your SSL traffic is now potentially able to decrypt it. But that's probably a little bit far-fetched. I don't think this is an APT attack or NSA is behind this or something. It's just an honest programmer's take, I guess, and um, I guess the guy who did it was pr is probably very, very embarrassed right now. So that's for our little interruption. And now um, back to our regular scheduled program. I was actually going to talk about what we call, or what the industry calls, software-defined networking, basically what, what you can do with Open vSwitch. And um, that's what we're going to look at for a little while. Um, basically, first, a high-level approach, so what, what is SDN? Let's get a little buzzwords out of the way. And um, what are we going to do, or what were we going to do with, um, with this stuff? And then I'll have an uh, introduction for Open vSwitch and tell you how we deployed it, which is probably not the best practice, but this worked for us. Um, then um, differentiation between front network, back network, public network, firewalling, and then tying, trying to tie it all a little bit together. So what are we talking about here? Software-defined networking is something that's been circulating for, I don't know, two or three years now as a, as a buzzword. And um, it's being very heavily hyped with competing standards at the moment. And um, I don't really like those hype buzzwords because normally they are just hiding something that we have been using for, for years. And um, they just give a little shiny package around it. Um, what we de do here is basically we decouple the actual networking decisions from the bare metal that has the networking ports. Um, essentially, we kind of virtualize um, parts of our network, and we try to separate or decouple our control plane, our data plane. So whatever does the switching doesn't um, decide where, where to send data or where not to send data. That's decided somewhere else. We have a couple uh, or very many vendors that jumped on this train. Of course, all the big networking vendors, also VMware, um, OpenStack, um, the virtualization um, middleware vendors are also um, deeply involved here. One of the main keywords for OpenFlow, and this is where I will very closely watch for uh, you, Frown, is um, OpenFlow, um, which introduces the concept of imperative control. Basically, it says that whatever does the switching is dumb, doesn't have its own logic or intelligence. Um, it just has the ability to um, read and interpret um, a decision that has been made by someone else, and that's uh, the open flow controller. Basically, um, the first packet of each flow, which is a tuple of um, ports and IP addresses or MAC addresses, stuff like that, is sent through um, the controller, which um, applies a set of rules given to him and then makes a decision. And every subsequent packet of that flow goes directly through the switch because the switch also uh, already knows um, which rule to apply, has these cached, and um, can forward directly. There is also a new concept which was r introduced rather recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, which is called OpFlex. Uh, it's an initiative by Cisco who probably feel a little bit threatened by the idea that um, switching hardware should become very, very dumb again because then they cannot sell expensive, smart switching hardware anymore. Um, so it's kind of their um, answer to OpenFlow. And there are a couple of other vendors already on board. Um, Citrix, for example, Microsoft, um, Red Hat, Canonical. And um, there are some not on board. The Big J, for example, 
um, HP has been left out, UOI, so they will have to copy from Cisco firmwares, I guess. And uh, VMware is also not uh, um, collaborating on this standard. Um, the idea behind Opflex would be that um, you do not do what is called imperative control, but declarative control. Um, basically, um, there is a high-level declaration of how the controller wants um, traffic to flow, and um, the uh, switch, the, the forwarding plane, the data plane, actually interprets that, um, that high-level rule into flow-based rules that, that are then interpreted by the forwarding plane. Um, it's a proposed standard um, for IETF, uh, which is uh, downloadable via the uh, usual channels. And um, of course, the altruistic goal that's being propagated is we want to um, eliminate a potential single point of failure. Right now, in these imperative um, setups, the controller is a single point of failure for the whole networking. If a controller controls maybe a dozen or a hundred um, switches, and the controller fails, um, it's, I don't know, an electricity problem or something like that, um, all the switches cannot um, continue switching as soon as the current flows uh, are ended, so no new flows can be accepted and forwarded. And um, Cisco is saying that we can eliminate that um, single point of failure by just putting more logic into the uh, switches so they can forward um, even with, it, with, their, with their controller not being available anymore. And the egoistic goal for a big networking vendor is, of course, to sell smarter switches, which are potentially more expensive because they have more um, complex software built in and potentially um, stronger hardware to, to actually make the uh, switching decisions. The open source contender or product for this is Open vSwitch, which is... Um, maintained on openbswitch.org. Current stable release is uh, 2.1 something, and long-term release is 1.9, so they have an LTS concept, and they, um, you, you can basically deploy a long-term service version, which we do. It's uh, open sourced, um, uh, dually licensed uh, under an Apache license and uh, GPL. Um, the Apache part is the controller, and the GPL part is the kernel module that does the data path. So um, because it's part of the kernel, it has to be GPL. Um, but the controller is under a non-viral license. Um, it's a multi-layer switch, which can switch on layer twos and three, for example. And it supports a lot of interesting features, of which I'm not using, I don't know, a fourth or something. Um, we're probably not using one-tenth of the potential of Open vSwitch in our setup. And I guess there, um, it has something for everyone. So it supports VLANs, of course, but also supports NetFlow and SFlow for traffic accounting. Um, you can do LACP like you would with any regular switch. And you can also do um, filtering on uh, layer two and three. So um, high-level overview would be um, you have a kernel module in the bottom that sits in the kernel and does the actual, um, the actual uh, forwarding. And you have a vSwitch daemon um, and a OSV, uh, OVSDB server, which um, sit in the user space and uh, contain the uh, OpenFlow and interpret the OpenFlow rules and forward interpreted rules to the um, kernel module to actually do the switching. And you can have an external that that's very tiny up there, but it says off box, the top dashed line. Uh, you can have an external control cluster, which um, basically does all the uh, decisions externally and um, manages a whole um, a spread network. Um, in the middle sits the um, OVSDB, which is basically a database for, for switch configuration items. It contains the definitions for the bridges, tunnels, interfaces that run on your Open vSwitch instance, and it um, contains also the addresses for the controllers, if you have external controllers. Um, configuration is, of course, reboot safe, so you wouldn't have to um, feed the whole configuration uh, into the database again after rebooting. Um, it's not anything we know as far as I know. So it's not MySQL, SQLite, Mongo, or something like that. It's a custom database format. Um, speaks a custom protocol. And um, it's basically log-based. So you can see all the changes by um, dumping a log of the database. And um, that's very good for change management or for debugging. If you see something has changed and now it's not working anymore, you can basically see all the changes and then roll back to the last working state. As I said, OVS does um, imperative control. So basically, all intelligence is in the uh, controllers, and the data path component, which sits in the kernel, only carries out instructions. Um, it's a kernel module licensed under GPL v2, and the controller lives in user land as uh, licensed under Apache 2.0 license. 
So graphically, this looks like this. Um, the concept is that everything is a flow, so um, a combination of input and output ports, TCP or switch ports, uh, VLAN, MAC addresses, IP addresses, TCP and UDP ports on layer three can um, define a flow. And the more defined a flow, the smaller it usually is, or the, the less packages it has, and the um, less ports or um, forwarding decisions it would match. The controller basically um, on the first packet sent for each flow, the packet is forwarded from the data path to the controller, which makes a decision how to deal with that uh, packet and the subsequent flow and um, forwards that decision back down to the kernel module and every subsequent packet is uh, in a flow is um, sent directly through the data path. So flow interpretation is only performed on the first packet of each flow. So you would have to, or you would want to make flows as large as possible so you don't have that much, much interpretation work. Um, the kernel module has a cache where basically there's a hash table of um, flow IDs to um, forwarding decisions. So it doesn't even have to um, look up the decisions anywhere else. It just can um, use cache decisions and is therefore rather fast. There's a set of um, command line tools which we use for uh, managing our setups. Um, I guess there's many smarter ways to do that, but that's how it worked for us. And we tend to never change the running system. There's um, OVS VSCTL, vSwitch control for switch management, OFCTL for flow management, where you can basically um, uh, modify uh, or flow rules. And there is a database management tool, which is called OVSDB tool, which ca you can use to, to dump your logs or um, um, check, uh, check flow debugging and stuff like that. So our angle here is, of course, we are a hoster, and it was our goal to host a public cloud. So we wanted to have an IaaS product offering that, based on um, open source software, can uh, be used by customers to host VMs with uh, a couple of features. And first of all, the VMs would need networking. So you can probably see where this goes. Um, this is a very tailor-made solution that we made for our um, purposes. It it's just not a, it's not a general purpose solution. It works for us and it might very well not work for you. It might also work for you um, too. Uh, you will have to see for yourself. What we wanted, what our requirements were was, um, we wanted of course an internet facing front net interface for every VM so they can get a public IP address and they can talk to the internet. Uh, we also wanted them to have a backend um, network that is only shared with other VMs of the same customer. So basically we wanted VLANs for VMs. Uh, we wanted the VMs of course to be isolated uh, in, a, in, a, in the network. We, didn't, we don't want other customers to see traffic of their uh, neighbors on the same machine, but I guess that's a given. Uh, we wanted firewalling, um, off VM firewalling that is, uh, so people could have a, a packet filter that sits in front of their um, VMs and not on the VMs. Uh, we wanted to be able to shape, um, mostly for terms of service uh, breaches. So if someone has an owned machine and is just shelling out spam or traffic, DDoS traffic, um, we wanted to be able to um, put them back to, I don't know, one Mbit or something like that. Um, we wanted some rather fine-grained accounting um, to do IP traffic accounting, um, and we wanted to be able to live migrate from one host to another. So in an implementation, it would like this. You have your um, VM boxes, which are the orange um, boxes, and a lot of VMs sit in them, and basically the physical boxes are co um, connected to a front-end switch and to a back-end back switch, and um, the VMs will have to get their um, networking from there somehow. Um, virtually, it would like like this. There are two interfaces in each uh, VM. One of them, the green one, goes up to the internet and goes through a firewall, and the red one um, basically only goes into other VMs of the same customer, but can span across multiple hosts. So um, we would have to have inter-host uh, uh, VLANs and um, it's basically not po uh, possible to go from there to the internet, only to other VMs that belong to the same customer. Um, in the stack, it would like, look like this, of course. Everything is basically connected to Open vSwitch via a bridge. Um, the Open vSwitch uh, instances are connected to each other, and they also have an internet-facing um, interface that goes, goes outside. So how to do this? Um, we uh, 
turned out to be compiling Open vSwitch ourselves. There are packages in uh, apt for, I think, Ubuntu and Debian. I'm not sure which versions they, they run because we don't use them. Do you know about that? Okay. Yes. So it's probably a fair bet to compile stuff yourself, I guess. Um, yeah? Um, why don't you use the 142 from Debian? So if you want APT, I think you run Ubuntu or Debian? We, we run Ubuntu mainly. Okay, so in Debian we, we run a OB switch with 142. It's 142. We're pretty happy. Um, the, the question was why we don't run um, the Debian stock packages, which have um, Open vSwitch 142, you said. Um, I'm actually not the guy who, had, um, who admins the machines, but with older Open vSwitch versions, we had issues. I don't know the exact issues, but there were issues, and um, eventually we landed um, on uh, 193, which is the current long-term stable release, and we're pretty happy with it. Uh, we don't need any of the newer features, Right at the moment, and uh, we tried newer versions, and it, they don't really work with our farm. So it's, it's after you have a dozen or so hosts, it becomes a little delicate to to switch to new OpenB switch version because you just introduce downtime for pretty much everyone, and mixed setup um, proved to be not a really good idea. So having different OpenB switch versions talk to each other, that's not really a hundred percent super stable. So we, we basically settled for the LTS release, and we're pretty happy with that. But whatever floats your boat, if it works for you, it's fine. Um, yeah, I think everybody compiled something before, so I don't think I should probably talk about this. Um, there's a kernel module, and it can be enabled. I think it's in, in, in mainline, uh, or isn't it? Um, from 3.3 plus. Um, you can just uh, enable it, recompile, and then mod probe. Um, after that, you would have to create the OpenB switch DB. There is a, um, a schema file, which is, oh, sorry, there's a slash missing there. Um, there's a schema file, which is in the um, source code for OpenB switch, and um, you would usually, we, we usually do that. You can probably discuss this very long. Um, we usually put our OpenB switch stuff in user local, and the database would sit in user local etc, open, OpenB switch then. And um, one thing that proved to be important for us is that Open vSwitch and the OVS database need to be started before the, the actual networking starts, and that kind of conflicts with uh, how Ubuntu and Debian run things. So you would probably have to remove the networking startup scripts from your um, RCD and put them into RC local and put the OVS vSwitchD and OVSDB server calls before them. So you can be sure that your Open vSwitch environment is running before you uh, set up the rest of the networks. Then initially, uh, we start bridging. Basically, we do a lot of bridging, and we do a lot of tapping. Um, first off, uh, the examples would be we have a front net um, VLAN, basically broadcast domain for maybe um, 100 VMs at a time or something, and the v VLAN ID would be 199. So basically, we tell Open vSwitch to add a bridge on VMBR1, and we tag it with uh, VLAN 199. And then we log into our machine via some kind of out-of-band control, IPMI or something like that, because we're going to lose networking. Um, so we add, the port to the, uh, add our Ethernet port to the bridge, and we see the machine drop from the net because um, it has the wrong VLAN tag on the main Ethernet port now. So we then go to our switches and make the VLAN known to the uh, physical switching port, so the machine comes back online. Um, for VMs, we uh, use tap interfaces, like probably most people do. Um, we rerun KVM QEMU, so you see a QEMU call here for starting the machine. And um, basically what we do first is we add a tap device and um, own that to the user who runs our middleware scripts. And then we start up the um, QEMO instance. Uh, we give it a custom MAC address, which is here. And um, we bind it to the tab interface that we have here. Um, that would probably have to be VLAN 199. I didn't modify the, the script correctly. Sorry for that. After that, you can um, bring up the port. And you don't. Uh, you have a you have a running tap interface now um, that runs or that that uh, connects to the VM, 
And now you will have to find out on which actual open vSwitch port it runs. So basically, we want to see from the tab interface wh where the virtual cable connects to the virtual switch. Uh, we can do that with uh, open flow control. We can just show um, our main bridge. And uh, we just grab for the tab device that we just connected. And uh, now we can see the port number on the open vSwitch instance. And we can use this port now for managing our flows. If you want to have multiple inter interfaces per customer, um, basically you just assign more tab interfaces and you assign different VLANs. If you want to have one VLAN per customer, you'll run into problems after you have about 4K customers. Um, if you have them on the same node and you don't have to make the VLANs publicly known, you will probably not have an issue, but usually you will have to have um, cross-node VLANs because you cannot deterministically say which VM runs on which node, at least we. Um, we don't run VMs of one customer on one node. doesn't make a lot of sense for HA purposes. Um, you, if you have to have inter-node um, private VLANs, you will have to do whatever you do to make VLANs known on your physical switches. And then you'll have cross-node inter internal networking, which proves to be very helpful for customers. But, of course, usual VLAN limits apply. So. Something that Eve will probably talk about are overlay networks. Um, he's going to have his talk at 4 o'clock, I think. 5 o'clock. Um, he's going to talk in depth about OpenStack networking and is probably going to refer also to um, the rescue here, which would be overlay networks, stuff like VXLAN or something, which we currently don't use because it's not present in our Open vSwitch version. Open vSwitch 193 doesn't have VXLAN. I think that's a 111 plus or something feature or relatively recent. So we don't, we are not currently able to, to use that. Um, but we we'll probably will have to evaluate it pretty soon. So now we have um, an interface which is connected to virtual switch port. And that port number was 1820. Um, we can see it up there in the first line, and now we can start um, filtering stuff. So first thing we would probably want to filter was um, is Mac and ARP spoofing, um, which we can do with OpenFlow. So basically what we do is now we add a bunch of flows um, which concern the, the port that we defined here as a variable. It's, it's up here, 1820, so this is the port that we just brought up. And um, these this resubmit is probably even redundant, so it's not really optimized for performance. You can probably do a lot of performance optimization on open flow rules. Um, but basically what we do is we check for the MAC address and the, the uh, MAC source. And um, if it doesn't really fit, we just drop it. Um, rules are interpreted um, numerically descending. I never seem to memorize that. Mem numerically descending is right, right? Yeah. Um, we, of course, know the MAC address because we control the hypervisor and we can just define a MAC address to, um, to uh, be present in the VM. And also, we, of course, know the IP address because it's uh, the IP address assigned to our VM. So we can bind these two together and um, prevent um, bad guys or bad customers from, from spoofing there. Um, that would be our spoofing. I think, or maybe I just copied the wrong, um, wrong slide. Um, there's a couple of caveats for that. Sometimes uh, you actually want customers to be able to spoof because that's one of the features that you would use for stuff like ZRM Mon um, or other um, Linux HA solutions to hand over the virtual IP addresses. And we have a couple of customers who run HA clusters across our um, uh, cloud cluster, and they have VMs that sit on n different nodes, and each VM sits on another on a different node than um, its uh, counterparts. And um, th these people have to ha be able to bind a second IP address um, to the MAC address. And um, uh, if you uh, want to cater for this by design, you can just um, assign uh, sequential MAC addresses to IP address uh, to uh, VMs uh, from the same customer. So you can have a a per customer MAC address pool, and you can assign them sequentially. Then you can use wildcarding in the open flow rules to um, actually um, apply the correct filters. Or you, have just, you just have to set additional rules to cater for the cluster um, or virtual IP address, however you want to, to, to call it. Um, you should probably never allow customers to enter their own rules anywhere, um, but I think that's a given. So this is um, another, um, now we are moving a TCP uh, to TCP, so we're moving a layer higher. 
This is another um, open flow example where you can see that we are now actually um, doing packet filtering. So we have a, um, we have a rule that um, defines traffic between 192, 168, 1, 1, 2, 3, and 12, 13. Um, and the destination port would be AT, HTTP, and we don't want anything to uh, happen there, so we drop traffic. It's a very specific, very straightforward, very simple, simple rule, which effectively um, blocks traffic to port 80. You can also use port ranges here. That's a slightly more complex thing here. Um, the port range would be here. These are um, hexadecimal bit masks. So basically, um, what you do to calculate the port mask is um, you use um, like sitter masks uh, only for ports. And what we do here is we um, drop traffic from ports 1512 to 1516. From Open vSwitch 1.11, um, there is wildcarding for pretty much everything. You can wildcard MAC addresses, you can wildcard um, TCP, UDP ports, and um, I think this concept is called mega flows because you do what I said initially, you dr drastically increase the matches for your flow um, setup. So basically, um, what we see here is a definition for one flow, and it concerns uh, traffic between a, a slash 24 network and a slash uh, 32 IP address on four different flows. So the, the data plane, if it sees traffic come to one of these ports, only has to um, cache one flow rule, not four of them, or uh, 256 for the whole slash 24 network. It's just one flow, it's one rule, and one cached entry. And that makes everything, of course, a lot less memory dependent. And for large networks, it would probably scale really, really well. But you of course, you broaden your matches, which is not a problem for a drop if you want a lot of security anyway, but might be um, a problem for permissive rules. And regarding permissive rules, this is our um, fall through rule, which we have at the end of each um, uh, flow definition or firewall definition, and that basically accepts everything that's not matched by previous rules. So this looks just a very quick look at this. Uh, in production, um, I have the configuration for my own for my own VM here, and um, yeah, that's just the rule set that we apply here. So this is my public-facing IP address, and well, nothing really fancy here. It's basically what I what I have on the slides, and uh, we also have a, I think we have a fallback to IP tables if um, the OpenV switch module can't be found, but this is what we what we use for OpenV switch. So nothing really uh, surprising here. <coughs> OK, um, on to the other features. Um, we do accounting very simply. We just use the interface counters on the tab interfaces, and we, we um, grab the counters regularly and just put the, datas into a, the deltas into a database. Um, with um, OpenVSwitch, you can also use NetFlow or SFlow. And I guess your mileage will vary about how, um, how well you can do that for actual accounting that flows back into billing. Um, especially for NetFlow, you will probably have a lot of, really a lot of data and you will have to have, uh, to have a strong box interpreting that, but that goes for every NetFlow setup. So we didn't go there yet. If anyone here does um, NetFlow or SFlow for accounting on vSwitch, uh, I'd, I'll be glad to hear your experience. Nobody? OK. Um, next feature would be shaping. Um, that's a topic where, um, especially in the low-cost area, um, where you have a VM that's basically five bucks a month, um, you don't want that VM to shell out 20 terabytes of traffic. Um, so you need a, a way to somehow polish this. Simply um, put, you can basically go ahead and just um, do um, ingress policing, and you can just limit the overall data rate. So basically, you can say this is now a 10 Mbit interface, not a gig E interface anymore, um, which is very close to um, the Linux shaping uh, syntax. You have a normal flow rate, and you have a burst rate, which goes on top of the flow rate, so those, these are additive. Um, you can also have very um, complex um, QoS, which basically um, does Lin Linux HTB, and um, you can configure um, very, very uh, fine-grained um, how you want to apply quality of service parameters to um, your cloud. 
again, we don't do that. We, we do shaping occasionally uh, for customers that um, fall out of the fair use policy, but, um, and that works mostly as intended, but um, we don't do any complex QoS. So if anyone does that, um, does OpenStack networking support that out of the box? Is there ways to do that in OpenStack? It depends on the plugin you use. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so shaping for just bandwidth shaping is rather simple. Um, complex stuff can also be done and um, you can basically do QoS on, I don't know, port 80 or you can, you, you can shape BitTorrent traffic or whatever you want. And um, that's also supported by OVS. It's a bit tricky, I've read, but uh, it's possible. Um, regarding live migration, um, OVS has, has support for um, live migration by establishing a GRE tunnel between the OVS instances on the receiving and the losing host. Uh, what we basically do is we, um, we start the VM up in suspend to RAM mode on the receiving host and stop the VM on the um, losing host down the interface and then bring it up again. And we have rather short up time also that works. Um, there are live migration mechanisms in OVS. Again, we don't really use them. So if anyone has experience, I'm just looking at OpenStack again. Um, I'd be happy to hear. Um, we do have a lot, of, a lot of things until we find a working solution and then we tend to stop looking at them because as, as soon as it works in production, um, it's probably uh, fair enough to, to continue using it. And uh, we are very sensitive about our um, uptime. So it's out of the question to um, update to a new OVS version just to have this and that feature. It's, that's not really in the, in the picture for us at the moment. So um, the, the layer two based um, live migration mechanisms that exist in OVS, I don't really have a clue about them. So um, there's a couple of very good presentations about, um, uh, among others, these features, which are in the link collection at the end of the slide. So if you want to clue yourself up, either you can look at that or you can look at Eve's um, session at 5 p.m. So that concludes everything. I think we're just on time here. Um, thanks, everyone. I hope you learned something, or you could just laugh to yourselves uh, on my expense. And if not, uh, well, I will, would buy you a beer, but it's 10.25 uh, a.m., so that's maybe a little early. But if you have any more questions, just feel free to shoot now. Yeah. You talked about the single point of failure in the controller. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Um, we don't have the problem because our layout is different. Um, just repeating the question, um, I was asked how big the single point of failure problem for uh, failing open vSwitch controllers is. Um, we basically co-locate the controller on the machine that runs the open vSwitch instance. So um, there's not a, many, lot, not a lot of failure scenarios. The, the process could crash because of out of memory or because of reasons. Um, then you would have you would um, have to restart networking pretty soon, or you will lose connectivity on the instances. Uh, yeah. Does it mean that each virtual machine host runs its own controller, and you don't have any system-wide host over over um, Currently, we don't. No, we have a we have a centralized host that does the management, but it's basically configuration management. So we don't use the, I said that earlier, we don't use the um, OVS internal controller mechanisms to have basically one central controller that, uh, central open vSwitch controller. We have, a cent we have a central machine that basically manages the configurations and we manage, currently manage everything by uh, configuration file and not with a central controller. So we don't have that failure scenario, but that wasn't intentional. Honestly, um, we just f uh, felt it to fit into our workflows better and to our deployment workflows better. And um, if you have a central controller sitting in the middle um, and that controller fails for some reason, um, you will have to restart it um, rather quickly because otherwise, as soon as the currently cached flows are not valid anymore, so new traffic comes in with a different flow spec, um, you will not be able to accept that. There's a, I think there's a fail open mechanism in Open vSwitch that can be uh, used for that, uh, where you basically s forward everything, but, well, that's also not the best solution. And there's also, um, I think, a possibility to cluster these controllers so you can high have high availability um, to avoid for those pitfalls. Yeah. It's 
based on I'm I'm sorry, I I didn't I didn't hear you. Yeah, exactly. Um, the question was if we have some stock solution or something custom built and we have a custom solution that we wrote um, to manage the configuration stuff. It's not, it's not Puppet or something, no. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, in the corner. And do, do you happen to know if it's possible at all to spread out the controller part of, of Open vSwitch or if, it's, if it has to be a single machine? Uh, as far as I know, you can cluster it um, somehow. It doesn't have to be a single machine. Correct me if I'm wrong. It doesn't have to be a single machine. And you would be able to spread it out. Um, but for example, have an um, HA solution to, um, to avoid um, single point of failure. Should should not be an issue. We don't use this, so I don't have a lot of mileage here. Okay, um, you will receive the slides after um, the conference, I think. And in case you want to have a look, um, these are the presentations I was talking about. And I wish you all a nice rest of the conference. And thanks for for listening. <laughs>